Welcome everyone to NGW's In A Nutshell podcast, where we look at the latest trends and developments occurring in the natural, global natural gas industry. Uh, today, as usual, I'm joined by Thierry Bross, Professor at Sciences Po Paris, and Anne-Sophie Corbeau, research, research Scholar on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. Good to have you both with me. How are you doing? Fine. Very well. It's September, and so far, so good. The prices are much lower than they were last year. Certainly. Certainly. But still very high, exactly, uh, for historically. Um, let's, let's start by talking about the short-term volatility we saw with the uh, Australian LNG uh, strikes. To what extent did that show... Uh, how much the global market is still quite vulnerable to to, to supply shocks. Um, Thierry, do you want to start? Yes, I think what, what we have to understand, volatility increased, and interestingly enough, it increased in plain uh, summer. Why? Because uh, in the old days, if we go back to prior 2020, there was some spare capacity in the gas system. The spare capacity was mostly in the hands of Gazprom, but not only, but mostly in the hands of Gazprom. And so therefore, mm -hmm. there was this buffer, this ability to do this. We do, you know that we still have this in, in oil. It's in the end of OPEC plus that is using it uh, to uh, balance the market, but also as a political tool. But this mm -hmm. is a uh, spare capacity is de facto limiting this, uh, the, the, uh, the volatility. If you have no spare capacity in the system, and unfortunately, we are going to live with this uh, in the gas industry for a few more years, then you mm -hmm. have volatility because any kind of uh, a news flow, uh, even if it doesn't materialize at the end of the day, will have an impact on prices because traders will have to uh, review their spreadsheet and to understand uh, the, how is this going to impact uh, my supply demand balance, my global one, my European one, and the prices. So I think we are in for a period of uh, higher volatility for a longer time and uh, for a longer period. And we have uh, seeing this, as you rightly mentioned, Joe, in, in August with the uh, news flow of Australian strikes, when we have absolutely or very little uh, Australian LNG coming into Europe. Mm -hmm. But this yeah, is also yes, a certainly. global market. So whatever happens at the end, uh, at the very far end of Asia, has also implications for Europe because we are all sharing the same pool of LNG. And as you mentioned, Thierry, we are going to have two years of a tight market ahead of us before a lot of LNG supply comes on stream. But meanwhile, uh, this market is going to remain tight. What I find also interesting is that uh, the previous components of the global gas market, which were providing this flexibility uh, are gone or almost gone. I mean, uh, the interaction between LNG and pipeline gas in Europe, mostly Russian pipeline gas, is pretty much gone because we are getting mm -hmm. very little Russian pipeline gas right now. And it's probably not going uh, to increase if the European Commission achieves its objective to get rid of Russian gas by 2027. Uh, the second mm -hmm. one was the interaction between natural gas and coal in the power market. Uh, this one is also probably going to decline, even if coal has come back over the past uh, two years because of security of supply issues. And the last one, which remains, is storage. But everything which was making mm -hmm. Europe as uh, a balancing market, as I mean, the three pillars, two are going. And this is basically setting the stage for a much more volatile market. Even more that we are seeing a rise of renewable, which means that we are going to see more volatility in terms of gas demand in the power generation sector. So this is in mm -hmm. fact leading some people to say, well, now it's no longer Europe, which is going to be the global balancing market, but it's going to be China. However, China is not exactly Europe. I mean, uh, these three pillars are not exactly the same. There is not as much storage capacity. The interaction between natural gas and coal in the power sector I mean, it's not dictated by uh, spot prices. And finally, the interaction between pipeline gas and LNG is not exactly the same thing. And it's very unlikely that we are going to see uh, LNG basically pushing back pipeline gas, especially pipeline gas from Russia in China is, is extremely cheap. So, you know, these kind mm -hmm. of dynamics are not going to play. And they are also not uh, basically priced at the same type of prices. 
uh, there is quite a lot of um, oil indexation still in China. Mm -hmm. and, and if I may, I'll add to uh, what An Anzo stated is that we had one more uh, uh, buffer in Europe, which uh, has been removed. It was called Groningen. Uh, and Groningen was also there uh, to, uh, to help the uh, seasonality. Um, on, on, on the uh, pipe versus LNG that uh, Anso mentioned, I fully agree. I would only say that perhaps that uh, perhaps China is uh, in the longer term going to be able to do this uh, LNG uh, pipe switch, i.e. I agree it's, uh, the pipe is way, way cheaper than the LNG, but it will over contract some LNG to be in a position if it needs it because it has very low storage to take the LNG and if it doesn't need it because winter is mild to push this LNG into Europe and you've seen that mm -hmm. the Chinese have already uh, started not only to over contract but also to uh, start desk uh, trading desk in London and have booked some regas capacity in Europe so I think the flexibility that we used to have in Europe uh, Russian pipe gas versus LNG uh, has uh, been removed, fully agree, but may uh, come back in China in a few years' time once the power of Siberia is at full capacity and maybe another pipe is there. Mm -hmm. Maybe, but uh, this is going to take probably 10 years if we take the example of the power of Siberia one. And this pipeline has not been sanctioned yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly a long time for negotiations for the power of Siberia one pipeline. Um, so, yeah, it's worth bearing in mind uh, as much as uh, Russia wants this pipeline deal as quickly as possible. It, yeah, you have to consider these things take time. Um, with regards to preparation for this coming winter in Europe, um, situation is, of course, less dire, to put it mildly, than uh, a year ago. Prices, as we, as we said, are much lower, still historically high, but much lower than a year ago. Storage is reaching close to full capacity. Um, how well is Europe prepared for this winter uh, with the risks of you know, further reduction in Russian supply for whatever reason, um, particularly cold winter, disruptions in LNG, the usual, the usual risks? Uh, and Sophie, I think would you we, like are, we, we are better prepared. I mean, uh, we are in a better position. Uh, as you mentioned, storage levels are about 95%, which is 7 to 8% higher than last year. We have uh, we are so high in terms of storage that we have started to actually put the natural gas in uh, Ukraine, uh, which, mm -hmm. which, of course, is very much welcomed by the Ukrainians because they want to reattach their own energy system to the European one and get rid of, you know, the Russian parts. Uh, but, mm -hmm. of course, you know, risk remain and we should not uh, remain complacent. First of all, I mean, storage doesn't guarantee full security of supply. Storage is key to basically peak demand. You always need based on whether this is pipeline gas or LNG. So we will continue to need uh, this base supply, whether this is coming from North Africa, from Azerbaijan, from Norway. And do remember that in Norway, we have a lot of evidence over the past few months. So, I mean, Norway, while well, it has been really helping Europe uh, in order to basically uh, supply uh, Europe um, natural gas to Europe, uh, is now facing uh, a few issues. Um, mm -hmm. We also need to be able to continue to attract LNG. Uh, this has been the case so far, but it's very important to understand that first, I mean, full storage doesn't guarantee uh, full security of supply. The winter last year was particularly mild. And if winter were to be particularly cold this year, that would be some sort of a double whammy. We still have very low industrial demand, which doesn't seem to be coming back. And we, I mean, do not know exactly where and why this industrial demand is still lagging. I think there is a need for more understanding. In the power mm -hmm. sector, it's looking much better in terms of nuclear and also a little bit of hydro. 
and we have a growth of renewable, but you know, things can happen. I think on the LNG side, one of the biggest worry is that we may always have, you know, what I call usually the Murphy law, which is somewhere in the world, something may happen. Uh, last year, it was Freeport. Uh, two years ago, for example, it was, uh, Snowbit wasn't, wasn't there. There have been multiple incidents affecting and impacting the LNG supply and there could be more to come. Uh, we talked at the beginning about a potential strike in Australia, which has not materialized, but it's very important to remember that even in so-called friendly countries, um, LNG supply may not be available for various reasons. For example, if you have a very important um, hurricane season in the United States, for example, in October, that may impact not only uh, the fact that uh, some of these LNG plants, which are very close to each other in the Gulf of Mexico, some of them are, are like, you know, in a few hundreds of kilometers away from each other. So they, that may impact the fact that they cannot send uh, the LNG cargoes. But three years ago, one of them was also impacted during five weeks uh, because of the one of the hurricanes. So, you know, things can happen. Murphy's law, you said, yeah. I, I'm, Murphy's I'm not law, sure. Yeah, I always, not... <laughs> I always had that when I was doing my forecast of LNG supply and I was working for BP. I knew that somewhere <laughs> something would happen and that would basically decrease the availability of global LNG supply. The problem is that you never know which one is going to be impacted. Mm -hmm. With my surname, I've, I'm not sure whether I love or hate that expression. <laughs> I'm sorry about uh, that. <laughs> uh, Thierry, uh, something to add? Yeah, yeah, the good thing is uh, having a podcast with uh, anne Sophie is we uh, mostly agree on on uh, the main elements. So I fully agree with uh, what anne uh, just stated. Um, j just a few more points on my side. I think we have to, uh, policymakers have to avoid complacency because I think, as we mentioned, the volatility of the market is saying the market is tight and will remain tight and anything can happen. And if I, if, if I look at the uh, load factor of uh, liquefaction plant, if I take GII, GNL uh, number, last year it was 82%. Uh, load factor average, which is a high number. So again, as uh, Anso stated, it can go down. Something can happen somewhere and uh, there is very little growth. On the uh, volumes of LNGs that we've seen in Europe, we've seen an increase um, year on year until June when we were seeing a decrease, a massive decrease of in Russian pipe gas. Uh, right now, uh, we have uh, more or less the same amount of LNG, a bit less than last year, coming into uh, Europe since uh, June. But we have more or less the same uh, level of Russian pipe gas that we uh, had uh, last year. I mean, it's around those 2 BCM per, per month coming half from uh, Ukraine and half uh, via Tur uh, Turk Stream. And, and again, uh, half comes via Ukraine. There is a war in Ukraine. I don't think, uh, to answer your question, there will be some uh, Russian willingness to uh, reduce those volumes uh, lower uh, because those volumes, in fact, goes to uh, the five uh, uh, least uh, anti-Russian EU countries. It goes into Austria, it goes into Hungary, uh, just to name two of them. And so therefore, I think uh, Russia has an interest in keeping uh, those high volumes uh, going forward. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what I think could uh, happen uh, is something on the LNG as uh, and Sophie stated, but I think it can be uh, politically driven. I mean, uh, if you sit at the uh, Kremlin and you've seen what the volatility of uh, potential strikes in Australia that didn't materialize, as and Sophie stated, well, you may have a vested interest in trying to reduce the uh, Yamal LNG uh, volumes uh, this winter, because if you reduce, not reroute, reduce the volumes, uh, you're tightening the global market and you're creating a lot of problems in Europe first. And, and again, this looks a bit like what the Russians have done in diesel exports uh, last week. So I think mm -hmm. we have to uh, be prepared. Something can happen. It can be bad luck, but it can be a further weaponization of gas. It won't be, I don't think, weaponization of five gas, but it could be weaponization of LNG. And remember, final point, that the Russian treasury earns less money on LNG versus pipe gas. So for, for Russia, uh, if you sit at the Kremlin, it makes a more uh, uh, value to try to reduce the LNG versus to try to reduce versus, uh, further the pipe gas. 
Mm -hmm. I would like I to see. offer a slightly different view on that last point, which I think you know could be indeed uh, one thing that uh, the Kremlin could be doing, reducing uh, LNG supply, especially since there have been a lot of voices in Europe saying, oh my God, we are still importing about 20 BCM of Russian LNG per year. This is terrible. We need to stop that immediately. Uh, indeed, I mean, either, uh, you know, we could be doing that and the LNG would be going somewhere, or Mr. Putin retaliates as he has already done in the past and and cuts, you know, maybe one train, two trains of Yamal LNG. But what he could also be doing, which will be removing this volume from the spot market. And he could indeed weaponize to some extent that LNG by offering it to countries which have had the difficult access to very low price gas. I mean, to name them Southeast Asian countries. And that mm -hmm. would be for him an excellent political weapon because he could say, look, I perfectly understand that right now you have a very difficult uh, life because you could not have access to this LNG. Uh, this LNG now is at about between 10 and 15 dollars per MBTU. This is very expensive for you. But here, you know, I offer you LNG at say six to eight dollars per MBTU, which for Southeast Asian country is like in the acceptable range. So, mm -hmm. you know, they could sign a long term contract at this kind of prices and therefore that removes basically this LNG volumes, which is about 20 BCM for Yamal from the spot market. It's mm -hmm. increasing the demand in Southeast Asian countries and therefore means that for Europe, uh, there is less available spot LNG, which means that mm -hmm. prices in Europe will increase. Uh, that would be a slightly different outcome to what Thierry suggested. But I think we should not discount the fact that Putin is looking for allies, political allies on the global scene. And by Help by helping poorer countries which have been impacted by this global energy crisis, it could be seen as not exactly the savior, but somebody who is helping them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, when you when you say that, I, I'm thinking first and foremost about uh, Pakistan. Um, one example, having uh, held I don't know how many tenders uh, to attract spot cargoes, and and they keep they keep failing, um, and yeah interesting in terms of uh, the Kremlin gaining political capital uh, from and, and, and the Kremlin had supplies. this uh, had done this with oil when they had a discount to oil that in fact helped those countries not to go into recession and helped also the Kremlin not to feel completely alone at the UN level so uh, yes I mean there are many other ways to do it but I think we must be prepared mm -hmm. um Okay, Chinese LNG demand. How has it fared so far this year versus the initial expectations? And what happens when that market wakes up and we see the kind of growth we, we used to see in previous years? Well, the, the initial expectations were, you know, anywhere between very high growth and very modest growth. So basically people didn't know. And that's a mm -hmm. problem with China because China is a very big market. So first of all, you need to understand how gas demand in China is going to grow. And then you need to understand what is going to happen to the different components. First of all, domestic production, which is always going to be the first pillar from the Chinese point of view, because this is domestic. So that means security of supply. And this domestic demand has been growing quite fast over the past few years. And then uh, getting the gas from the different pipeline suppliers, either in Central Asia and then Russia, and then getting to contract LNG and finally to spot LNG if it's really needed. So depending on the appetite for spot LNG, then the demand for LNG can be more or less important. What we have seen so far is an increase for the first eight months of about 11% year on year, but last year it dropped by more than 20%. So we are not back to 21 levels, mm -hmm. uh, but we are somewhere in between 21 and 22. Uh, there is still a bit of uncertainty because we don't know what the end of the year is going to look like. And do remember that in China now there is a sizable portion, which is uh, residential commercial gas demand, which is 
basically mainly dictated by the weather. In 21, there was very cold weather in China. And, mm -hmm. you know, their gas demand in that sector increased quite substantially. So they, they know that. And I think given that they have also contracted a lot more LNG than they used to have uh, in 2021, for example, uh, they are in a better position to cover most of their gas demand or their LNG demand through long-term contracts, which are priced at a lower level than spot prices. And then mm -hmm. maybe they have a little bit more uh, possibility to buy additional spot LNG. Even if, you know, uh, usually they have relatively low tolerance for relatively high prices, but if they really need that, then maybe they could go to the spot market. So I was looking at what Sinoc was saying. And, and they were looking at, you know, uh, gas demand growth uh, to basically almost 400 billion cubic meters uh, for China. And the same thing as what we have seen in terms of LNG, a plus 11 percent for the full year, which is basically in line with what we have seen. So that would mean that for every month, September to December, we will see about 8.5 BCM of LNG imports in China. Mm -hmm. If, if I had to, to add a few things, first of all, I mean, I think we have to keep in mind that uh, since last year, uh, China has overtaken the EU as a, a gas market in terms of volumes, as a total gas market in terms of volumes. So uh, we, we are uh, smaller than China. Uh, second element, I agree with uh, your number and Sophie, I would just uh, uh, put them in, in a timely perspective. I mean, if you look at the first few months of the year, year-on-year -year, uh, growth, there wasn't any year-on-year -year growth. It was a year-on-year -year decrease in LNG. And now we are seeing a year-on-year -year growth in LNG intake in China, which is going to make it a more, bit more difficult. And this is why also, if you look at uh, the uh, mirror figure, which is Europe now, uh, we've seen um, LNG growth year-on-year -year in the first six months of the year. And now we are seeing LNG uh, drop year-on-year uh, versus uh, last uh, versus last year since uh, since June. So uh, we 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 are we are in a period where again complacency is going to be uh, unacceptable because China is waking up. I mean, uh, as Anne Sophie stated, we are in back to uh, some kind of growth. We we need to understand what kind of growth it is, but we are back in some kind of growth. And uh, energy is political in China. Uh, China has. Uh, wasn't helping us last year. Uh, China was just allowing uh, those cargoes to be rerouted because it didn't need it. Uh, mm -hmm. And so because China has very little storage, as Anne Sophie mentioned, um, they, they, will have a, uh, they will have a political view on LNG cargoes in, in, in winter. If it's very cold and they need the LNG, well, uh, they won't allow the contract, their own contracts to be rerouted. And, and I think that's also one of the problems of, of Europe. I mean, we were in a world where uh, when we were looking at security of supply uh, in Europe, we, uh, we were back many years ago uh, accepting this to be done by utilities. But utilities have not done this. I mean, if, if you think of the way we are doing security of supply in Europe, uh, back uh, before uh, the weaponization of gas, European utilities had... Uh, let's say 150 BCM of contract signed with Gazprom. Uh, out of those, mm -hmm. we, we only have, let's say, uh, 25 BCM left. So 100, let's say 125 BCM of long-term contract have been completely erased uh, overnight in Europe. And those utilities have not signed the same amount of um, LNG or pipe gas contract in, in, the, mean, uh, in the meantime. So, which means that uh, Europe relies more and more on spot markets, uh, but also is de facto less secure. So we will have to fight for the last available cargo with China. If China doesn't need it, fine, we will get it. If China needs it, not fine. We will not get it, whatever the price. Yes, and if I can add something, if my memory is correct, last year in October, the government of China said to the companies, I mean, you are no longer redirecting LNG cargoes to Europe because they remember mm. what happened at the beginning of 2021 when the weather was particularly cold and the companies were caught off guard because they thought, you know, I mean, at the end of 2020, given how loose the market had been in 2020, we are fine, no problem at all. We will be able to get whatever LNG we need they had not uh, contracted enough 
and then they were totally caught off guard. So for us, I mean, the worst scenario would be to have extremely cold weather, like in the beginning of 2021, but this time both in Europe and also in Northeast Asia, which would increase mm -hmm. the residential demand, forcing companies to be on the spot market and to try to fight between each other. What is helping us so far has been that, yes, Chinese LNG demand has been increasing, but Japanese LNG demand has been decreasing by even more. So this is what is helping on the tightness of global LNG market. And we should be careful uh, when observing a certain number of Southeast Asian countries. In many cases, their demand uh, dropped in 2022, but it's now slightly recovering, especially countries like Thailand, etc. I mean, have increased their LNG demand in 2021 and also it, uh, in 2022, and it's continuing in 2023. But a lot of countries are also seeing their LNG demand recovering. So we should mm -hmm. not completely discount these countries. Um, out of, uh, just for my understanding, um, why is it that China's uh, gas storage capacity is comparatively uh, low considering its its demand. I mean, I know demand has, has soared, um, but China is capable of doing some things, you know, building some things rather quickly. Um, is there a reason for that? Um, out of memory, I mean, it has always been uh, the case that China was sort of lagging in terms of storage development. I think they have realized that and they are trying to mm -hmm. develop, but of course it takes time. I mean, uh, they do not have the same regulatory framework than we do, but, you know, if you are looking mm -hmm. at uh, typical storage, underground storage development in Europe, it could take up to a decade. So mm -hmm. even if the Chinese can do that in five years, I mean, it's still taking a certain number of years, but they understand the importance of, and it's not only about underground storage. I mean, we have some countries in Europe which have very little in terms of underground storage, and Japan has also very little in terms of underground storage. They are counterbalancing that with a lot of LNG storage. It's not exactly the same right, dynamic, yeah. but it can also help a little bit. And China has been increasing its LNG gas capacity, like, very rapidly. I, I, I cannot even remember how many new LNG regasification terminals started this year. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and if I add, it's uh, because demand has been soaring, even if you massively invest, you still have a storage that only represents 5% of your annual demand and you're growing your storage by 5% per, or by 9% per annum to, just to keep with this. So I think that there mm -hmm. is this and the dynamic is, is still uh, uh, is still going to uh, be there. And again, growing your demand by 9%, growing your storage capacity by 9% is, is massive. Um, first element. Second element, I mean, if you're thinking about an energy transition, um, is this really where you should uh, put your money, gas storage? Perhaps not. Uh, mm -hmm. Perhaps you're, you're, you have a vested interest in thinking about uh, batteries where China has a uh, uh, a way uh, geopolitical advantage in in critical material, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I mm -hmm. think uh, th th there, if 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 I was the Communist Party, I will continue to uh, invest in in gas storage, but I will not over invest. And so, mm -hmm. therefore, at the end of the day, this five percent storage represent five percent of the annual demand may stay around this level when we have something like thirty percent in Europe. Mm -hmm. So a question of priorities as well. Um, okay, um, we've talked about this before, but the the expected uh, mid mid decades uh, rebalancing of the market. Um, any new interesting developments you've seen there? How is that you know process towards rebalancing shaping up? Um, Thierry, would you like to start? Well, I, I, I'd like to start here by looking at uh, EU security of supply, which I was alluding earlier. And, and as mm -hmm. I stated, we've seen uh, European utilities that have been uh, very shy in signing those long-term contracts because their political masters were telling them, well, we don't need gas uh, uh, in the longer term. And, and again, gas demand has gone by, down by 13% last year, is going to go down by another 9% this year uh, due to um, uh, gas, much less use in power generation, as Anne-Sophie was mentioning. But mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, um, the utilities are, in fact, uh, hedging themselves. They are thinking, 
well, if I go and sign a long-term contract, I'm going to have hassle from NGOs, from my political master. If I don't do, then prices will move up and my political master will subsidy uh, the, uh, the people and the industry, as we've seen last year with 800 billion euros that has been put uh, on the demand side, not on the supply side uh, in Europe alone. And so uh, utilities have, I would say, uh, are in the complacent uh, position saying, well, at the end of the day, why should I try to explain to my political master that we need more gas? Uh, because this is uh, a, a very tough job. Uh, they don't understand. They don't want to listen. They don't want to understand. And so let's let's do it this way. Let's go and, and buy spot. And if it's very expensive, then they'll uh, cash uh, the uh, subsidies out. Uh, it works mm -hmm. for uh, Anne Sophie and myself, fine, but it doesn't work if you're a big industry. And, and, and I think for me, what has been really interesting is the fact that BASF, the chemical uh, German company, has mm -hmm. signed uh, last month a long term contract with US LNG. Because if, if, if I may be politically incorrect, BASF was facing, in fact, very uh, small amount of choices. The first one is, well, I closed down my plants in Europe and maybe I build them in China or maybe I build them in, uh, in, in the US where uh, I need gas as a feedstock and gas as energy. Mm -hmm. Second is, uh, well, I have a duty to uh, the German people and so therefore I want to continue to produce my plastics or whatever in, in Germany. And so therefore I'm going to do it and each year I'm going to ask the uh, German a taxpayer to subsidy uh, to provide subsidy to uh, uh, to cover my losses works last worked last year starts to be more difficult this year and the third one is well nobody wants to provide me gas at uh, a long term price that is acceptable to my business uh, but I want to keep my business in Germany and so therefore I'm going to sign a contract where I have security of the volume and the price, so what I call the secured and affordable supply, and I can continue to do this. So I think here we are in a place, we are moving in a place where big industrial uh, demand centers are just saying to utilities, you, you, you're just not understanding what the business is going to be tomorrow. You're just uh, copying what uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, narratives that political leaders are providing you, which doesn't suit me. So I need to do this. And BISF for me is very interesting because BISF many, many, many years ago was doing exactly this with Gazprom. So this is why I started saying we've lost 125 VCM per year of long-term contract with Gazprom. And interestingly enough, the one that signed one of those contracts is BISF that used to have the wind gas uh, mm -hmm. uh, system. So I think we, th there is a change in mindset in Europe about the fact that uh, NGOs can say we don't need gas, fine, but some uh, people will need gas uh, to continue, BISF being one of the examples, and so they are doing it themselves. And, and interestingly enough, even the Director General from the uh, uh, Commission on Energy uh, stated this in the Financial Times yesterday. So I think there is a change. We haven't for the last two years done anything about supply. We need to look at supply and we need to look at supply in a non-naive way. How much gas do we need? How much gas can we rely on the market? And do we really at the end of the day want to, want to change uh, uh, something that was a dependency on gas from to be a dependency on China? Mm -hmm. So if I can add a, a few things to that and a little bit of color, I mean, we, we are looking at the global energy wave, which is going to be by far much larger than the one that we had before. And what is particularly interesting is also the fact that over the past two years, or at least over the past year and a half since, you know, the whole conflict started, most of the final investment decisions have been made in the United States, which is particularly interesting because all the projects are not in the United States. And when we saw a head of state going to different countries, they were also going, you know, to African countries. Mm -hmm. And, you know, behind that, I mean, I have the question about um, a just and fair transition, because it seems that this call 
for LNG, for additional LNG, is mostly benefiting one specific country and region. So that's my first point. But we have a lot of LNG coming. The question is really, when exactly is that LNG going to start arriving? Because with LNG plants, um, you know, we know which ones are under construction, but there is always a little bit of uncertainty about when exactly they are going to start. Uh, mm -hmm. Very few are actually starting on time. Um, some manage to start even a little bit ahead of time, but what we need now is for them to arrive as soon as possible, and if possible, in the 24-25 time frame, which you know is possible for a few of them, but not for all of them, because that will reduce the tightness of the global LNG market. Uh, in 2026, that would be probably, and 27 and 28, that would be probably a little bit more uncomfortable horizon for many uh, companies which are behind those uh, projects because I do anticipate that global gas prices are going to drop. Now, whether they collapse, that is an open question. Mm -hmm. To come back to what Thierry was saying on, uh, you know, the person from the DGNR which was commenting and saying that we will need US LNG for quite a long time. Actually, I mean, I was a little bit surprised and also a little bit annoyed by that statement because last year we had this document from the European Commission which was showing uh, energy demand, primary energy demand from different fuels in Europe and everybody in European organizations has been absolutely surprised by the very low level of expected gas demand by 2030 in Europe around you know anywhere between 150 and 200 billion cubic meters so if you really want to fulfill that demand we between the domestic production some biomethane uh, some pipeline gas coming from norway azerbaijan north africa well in fact you don't need that much of lng so now the question for the european commission is well, what has changed? You don't believe even more in your uh, forecast. You have become a little bit more realistic about what can be actually achieved. But then for everybody who is investing in the gas business, uh, whether this is in terms of infrastructure or in terms of long-term commitments that Thierry was mentioning, the question mm -hmm. is, okay, so what is going to be the gas demand in Europe by 2030, but also beyond, because we need certainty for way beyond 2030, especially if countries and companies are subscribing long-term contracts for 20 years, and also what is going to be our needs in terms of imports. And if I'm looking at all the scenarios which exist out there, I cannot get an answer to that. And mm -hmm. if I am taking, you know, the European Commission statement as face value, well, I have even more uncertainty. I mean, if I believe them, then I don't invest in anything. I don't sign any long-term contracts, and I'm certainly not investing into uh, regasification capacity, pipeline, etc., because everything is going to be ripped off in a couple of years' time. We just have to survive the next few winters. So we need to be really realistic and pragmatic about where are we going exactly. I know for the European Commission, you know, many people are going to be gone uh, maybe next here so it's going to be a brand new european commission but at the same time you know uh, for many companies they're investing long term so they need a little bit more certainty than the graphic that you can't really read the numbers and you are wondering what am i doing am i investing or am i not investing what how to plan and how to ensure security of supply which is absolutely essential if you have no idea about your future demand and your future imports so a new uh, commission, but uh, perhaps the same old ideas. Um, Terry, go Wait, ahead uh, and uh, 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 have your comments few, on that. Yeah, a, a, few, a few comments on the comments. Um, uh, Tim Amans, the uh, vice president for the Green Deal, has already left. So and, and he was on, on the extreme uh, dogmatic side. So I think that's mm -hmm. also perhaps one, one of the elements that explain perhaps the FT uh, article. Um, se second element, uh, I agree with you, I mean, and Sophie, I mean, uh, 150 to 200 BCM uh, in 2030 makes no sense. I mean, we are around 300 BCM. We've seen a huge uh, demand destruction. We've seen a, a very warm winter. I mean, are we going to, to see this when everybody talks, uh, is talking about reindustrialization and uh, needing more, more energy? Uh, plus, I, I'd like to add one element to this. Um, if you look at coal, and I think now people are starting to understand that coal is the enemy. 
in, in this energy transition. I mean, we, 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 we've been uh, uh, greenwashed by the Germans that were telling us that uh, coal uh, is, is okay and nuclear isn't. But I think we, we start to see this in, in many reasons. First of all, I think this has been uh, one of the elements of Macron's speech uh, yesterday. I mean, coal is the enemy. Um, and so if you want to move away all the coal uh, fired power generation in Europe and to replace it by something, because now we also understand that electricity demand will grow, so you have to replace this by something. If you want to replace this by gas, you need more than uh, 60 BCM of gas per year to do this. So you may not be completely gas, it may be gas and renewable, et cetera, et cetera. So I mm -hmm. think that, for me, is, is, is uh, really important. I mean, uh, 200 or 150 BCM in Europe by uh, 2030 uh, makes no sense. And so people are starting to uh, wake up and understand that the hydrogen strategy uh, was just a, a, a fake strategy with a fake math, magic math. Uh, is never going to deliver anything uh, and the size that was expected by uh, by Timmermans uh, when he signed it. Uh, I mean, those 20 million tons by 2030 have uh, already mm -hmm. been revised by the IEA uh, to something like five at best. Uh, and this is, you know, we, we, we are still a, a few years ahead. Um, I, I think uh, what we are going to see with your question about this commission, next commission, I think we, we are seeing uh, some governments uh, going a bit more pragmatic in this. I mean, um, uh, we've seen last week the uh, UK government, it's not in the EU any longer, but the UK government that came out with something uh, more pragmatic. Um, the, everybody says this is the first. I would fiercely disagree with this. I think the first government, democratic government, uh, to uh, have done this was the Greek government last year. Uh, it was like the uh, UK government, it was a, a conservative uh, government, what I called uh, blue, uh, or I will add blue petroleum uh, government, uh, that uh, wanted to uh, increase the energy intake and the energy production from Greece. Uh, they, they had extremely smart measures. I mean, they were the first government to uh, ask for uh, an electricity market redesign in Europe that hasn't still been done and it's been asked and asked and asked again. So they, they, they came out with some very pragmatic measures, more uh, offshore production uh, in Greek uh, water, more uh, regas capacity, more wind and solar, uh, providing more energy to Greece and the rest of uh, Europe. Um, so the UK is, is, is following the same path. Uh, we've seen yesterday Macron, I didn't understand, he wasn't speaking French, the kind of French I can understand, so I didn't really understand what he wanted. It seems to me he, he wanted to be more pragmatic. Uh, he wanted to have a green pass with uh, uh, providing economic growth and jobs uh, and reindustrialization. And again, this means more energy, not less. And so mm -hmm. I think in the next eight months up to the, or nine months up to the uh, MEP's election, we are going to see um, uh, parties that are trying to say, well, now it's not only a question about green or not green. Uh, am I... Uh, believing in climate change. Yes, everybody believes in climate change. So the problem is, how do we tackle this? Are we going to tackle this with magic mass, a la Timmermans? So you, 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 you spend subsidies and at the end of the day, nothing happens? Or are you going to do this in a pragmatic way, in a flagged way, in a step-by-step -step way? Which, by the way, and, and Rishi Sunak was right there when he stated this, the UK was best in class in CO2 reduction when it was inside the EU because of this. And so I, I really think a citizen will have a vote uh, next uh, in the next uh, eight months about how do they want this? Do they want a completely unrealistic program or do they want something that may not achieve the 1.5% but that is going to be acceptable and fair going forward? Mm -hmm. And I so, think this is a very important point because, I mean, we need something which is pragmatic and that people see as realistic. And as I stated before, I mean, very few of uh, the We Power EU targets are really realistic. I mean, so, I mean, what we really need are 
pragmatic and realistic targets. Because most of the WePower EU targets are actually very far from being realistic. I mean, we mentioned uh, the 20 million tons of hydrogen. Nobody thought that these targets were really going to be ever achieved. Whether this is about producing 10 million tons domestically or importing 10 million tons from wherever. I mean, there is mm -hmm. probably not enough hydrogen and projects which have actually taken FID to fulfill that demand. The danger right now, as I can see it, is that there is a little bit of what is happening already in Germany. This is uh, people being against all these changes. Why are they against these changes? I think uh, the ban on the boilers was a very good example. Suddenly you are telling people, well, I'm sorry, but you can no longer replace your existing gas or oil boiler by something which is going to be more efficient, but the same thing. You have to invest into something which is a lot more expensive. And that means that you are going to pay probably a few thousand euros from your pocket. And mm -hmm. that for many people is not always acceptable because a lot of people in this inflation era do not have any spare money on their saving accounts every month. So mm -hmm. how are they going to pay for heat pump, which, you know, if you are taking as uh, um, most evolved models is uh, easily 15 to 20,000 euros. That is simply not possible. And I think this is why we have seen uh, Macron going backwards on the gas boiler and also Rishi Sunak doing exactly the same thing. And maybe behind that, there is a fear that uh, some far right parties may have a pretty high share of the vote next year at the MEP election. Uh, mm -hmm. if, 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 if I may, I, what, what I'd like to, to, to add here, and I fully agree, I think if we go back to last year, people were saying the war will fast track the energy transition going forward. And, and I was one of those that was very cautious about this, saying, well, maybe not, because mm -hmm. we have loads of other stuff on our plate. Yes, there is uh, some emergen emergency in climate, uh, but there is also a war in Ukraine, and we have to finance this. And, and, and mm -hmm. we have to put 3% of our GDP uh, in, uh, in war efforts or in military effort. And, and mm -hmm. I think what we will end up is uh, the fact that because we've spent 800 billion euros last year on taxpayers' money to uh, help uh, the people to... Uh, um, to uh, go through the extremely high energy bill, we don't have this money any longer. I mean, this money ha has disappeared from state coffers. Mm -hmm. And so the energy transition isn't going to be fast-tracked. It's now the question is, are we going into pragmatism or are we just throwing targets that are never going to be reached? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a good point to, to end on. Um, one of our more longer uh, podcasts, but I'm sure it will be appreciated by the listeners and viewers. Very interesting discussion. Um, so yeah, thank you both for uh, giving me your, giving me and our viewers your thoughts once more. Um, this has been NGW's In a Nutshell podcast. See you next time.